You know, the book was written to make it clear that it's ordinary people who do extraordinary things. And my uh, unusual sort of journey through life, whether it was in tech or whether it's the Case Foundation or National Geographic, I've had this privilege of not just traveling around the United States, but literally around the world, including to some of the most remote places in the world. Um, and what I see everywhere is people have great ideas. They have ideas about how to make the world a better place. But they're often stopped with this idea that it can't be me. I don't have what it takes. Um, and so we kind of wanted to go to school on that a little bit. So about six years ago, the Case Foundation commissioned some research looking at the core qualities of change makers, innovators, and entrepreneurs who had broken through in a meaningful way. And what we found were these five principles, which are the basis for the book. But more importantly, what we found was we could debunk the myth that people get caught up in. And you need to be a special genius. You had to graduate from the right school. You know, everyone's idea of you have to have these conditions in order to be successful. And so the book is a storytelling book to bring the principles to life, to basically make it clear that these are people like myself, starting out in normal as a youngest you know, kid of four being raised by a single mom. No one would have looked at my life and ever imagined that I would have the opportunities or later a, a privilege to have in life. And it turns out that's true of people everywhere. So did your mother make you fearless? Well, I should say, although the book is called Be Fearless, it's really important to start out with a clear understanding that fearlessness is not the lack of fear, right? It's the ability to see that fear, stare it right in the eye, and push past it. So yes, my mother modeled that for me. Look, like everyone else, I struggle with that still routinely. But I am so grateful to have seen not only her, but my German immigrant grandparents, who had such an influence in my life, what they overcame and what they achieved, they were civic leaders you know, in their town. Um, what they achieved in their lifetime, what my mom would push past as challenges every day, definitely modeled for me a certain belief that you know, no matter your challenges, you can get there from here. Give us an example of today, something that you struggle with that you feel fear around. Sure, being on this book tour. <laughs> So with, together with my team, we've laughed a lot. You know, they're like, okay, the book is called Be Fearless, Jean. Uh, I am a fearless and fierce champion for things I believe in and for people that I back. Not so much when it comes about talking about my stuff. It's true. And so I've had to sort of get into a rhythm. Do you of, feel fear around it or you just don't want to do it? I would say, you know, there's this sort of fine line between fear and insecurity. Uh, but I would say I have felt both. You know, mainly to sell a book, you have to say the same things over and over again. You have to constantly talk about your book. And for me, how I've gotten through that is this book is a mission book. It's a clarion call to anyone with an idea out there or someone who's already on the journey of taking some great idea forward to get in the game, right? I say we need all the ideas and all the players on the field. We're at a 30-year low of startups in the nation, and I care deeply about the message that it can be you, it can be you, it can be you. And I mean that, and I use research to back it and inspiring stories. So that helps push me past what probably is a little bit of fear in talking about my own thing. So my favorite was Make Failure Matter. Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah. And how you interview people and ask about? Yeah, that, that failure thing, it's a big deal. And I don't know, you know where you sit in terms of your day-to-day -day living, your professional career, but the bottom line is that you know, we just talked about risk-taking. And in science and in medicine and technology, we understand R&D, the concept of R&D, which is trial and error, error. right? But somehow, in other, in other modes, it's almost like, yeah, we're going to try to do something new and bold, and we just expect 1,000% of it to work just fine. Thank you very much. It doesn't work that way. When you're taking risks and you're trying new things, you will have failures along the way. Make failure matter is not a celebration of failure, but rather a recognition that failure teaches. And just like in R&D, it's actually the errors that play the most significant role in helping you perfect okay. an idea, groom it, turn left if you have to, try a different way forward. But too often in both corporate cultures, in you know, firms, uh, in life, it's almost like we don't talk about failures, we just don't talk about that here. So there are sort of two chapters that um, I think really draw this out. And one is 
Uh, you know, we know this term crash and burn. And, you know, what if we called that crash and learn? What if we said this is the moment when we actually probably can learn some really significant things? That's only going to happen by being transparent about the failure and doing the hard work of saying, what have we learned here now and how do we apply it? The second one is fail in the footsteps of giants. Because one of the things that drives me crazy is we sanitize success stories. I mean, we really do, and you probably feel this too if you're out there and someone's introducing you. It all sounds so perfect, doesn't it? <laughs> so when that happens to me, I teach a lot of MBA classes, and if I'm in front of students, what I try to make sure to do is read a failure resume. I did a whole commencement address on this, which is to say all of the great opportunities for me came out of failure. They just did. But nobody likes to talk about the failure. So you've got a young generation, and sometimes not even a young generation. You've got teams. And they think, well, that person's never failed. So then when they hit their failure, they think it's curtains. It's like we, need, we really do owe it, I think, to one another to be more transparent when we hit failure. And I just want to say one thing. You know, there's a difference between screwing up and failure. Right. <laughs> Screwing up is like, you just didn't bring it. You didn't do what you should have done. And I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a diligent effort you know, to apply to you know, some breakthrough, some new thing you, your firm, are trying to do. And you did everything you should do, but you learned along the way that path wasn't successful. Um, so I just want to make that clear. So can you also tell us about the bubble of belief, which I love, and that takes us to the RV trip, yeah. which I think is so fascinating. Your so mind you, is blown by the RV I thing. Just Come think on, Melanie. You in the behind the big wheel is <laughs> Well, my odd. husband Steve is here with me, and I must say, we share the driving, and he probably does more than I do, would be fair to say. Um, so yeah, we would say, I don't want to speak for him, but we've talked about it. Uh, these trips that we do out into places where we are certain people are different than we are um, become, I think, for both of us, the highlight of what we do all year. And we do some pretty special things out How there. How long do you stay? Um, usually about two weeks, although this summer we're going to go entirely across the United States. So that'll be a little bit longer. Um, we've done it two ways. We have an Airstream, which is that silver bullet, if you guys remember it, that we love. And we have an SUV that we pull it with. Um, but this summer, to go across the country, we'll actually do like a 27-foot motor home where it's all one thing attached, because that's just a little easier to travel that many miles. And so you with. stay at the camps. Oh, you totally, do all the... totally. And, and we were talking earlier, you know, you might think, oh, do they set up the... No, it's Steve, it's me. When our kids went to college, we started doing this. It's a very intimate time. We love it. We you know, make our campfire dinners. We, we just really think it's great. But actually, what we love the most, and Steve does this with something that's called Rise of the Rest, where he's basically taking a bus one week at a time into communities through our nation's heartland, for the most part, and beyond, to unexpected communities. And he brings press and he brings investors with him to highlight and to spotlight the talent that we see across the country. But in this case, this is the two of us, and we love to go into community. And what we find is that, look, we're all in a bubble, even if we don't intentionally, if, even if we're not intentionally in that bubble. It turns out if, we, if we're not intentional about having people around us who are different with different perspectives and different ideas, you know, that's kind of a, then, then we will get in this bubble and our own perspectives will be limited. We're in a very divided time. People are gripped with fear and discontentment. One way out of it is to go spend time with people who are quite different. And I must say the reach beyond your bubble principle, which you're on, Melody, the uh, research is overwhelming both our research and then current research that it actually is diverse teams that have led to breakthroughs. You hear diversity and you might go, oh, that's a social justice thing. What does that have to do with business? Well, I'm here to tell you it has everything to do with business.